Hello, uh, welcome. My name is Dr Heidi Dawson Hobbes. I'm a senior lecturer in biological anthropology and I was just going to film a short video for you today just to give you an idea of um, one of the areas that we work on at the University of Winchester associated with biological anthropology. So I'm here in one of our labs. So this is one of our teaching spaces. Um, so you would use that for working on various modules. So one of those is um, working with me, looking at human skeletal remains. Um, other things you'd be doing in the labs include material culture work as well. Um, we look at fossil casts and skulls um, within some of our modules. So what I've got today, I've laid out one of our um, skeletons from the collection that we have at the University of Winchester. So this collection comes from the medieval cemetery of St Mary Magdalene, which was a medieval leprosy hospital that was situated just outside um, the city limits of Winchester. So the area, the cemetery and part of the chapel was actually excavated by the students and staff at the University of Winchester. And so we now care for and curate and work on for both teaching and research the human skeletal remains that came from that collection. So we have around 120 individuals. We have um, a wide demographic spread. So we have adults, both males and females. We also have um, juveniles ranging from neonates, so newborn babies, all the way up to kind of adolescent ages. So a wide range of individuals from the population. So one of these I've laid out here for you today to have a look at, and I was just going to run through some of the things that we can find out about um, individuals and in fact about their lives as opposed to their deaths from their skeletal remains. So what are some of those key questions that we want to ask when we're looking at skeletal remains? So it'd be really nice to know what age they were when they died. It would be useful to know if they were a male or a female. Did they have any um, disease that we can see on their skeletal remains or evidence for poor health, malnutrition, um, that might be able to tell us something about their lifestyle or their status um, when they were alive. So we'll just have a look at a few of these things using this skeleton. So we'll start off with thinking about age at death. So one of the first things to look at when we're thinking about trying to age an individual is the dentition. So our dentition, we start off when we're young children, we have that primary set of dentition comes through and then we shed those teeth and we get our permanent adult teeth. So first of all, we look to the dentition. So what I can see on this individual is that they do have all of their adult teeth and they also have the last of those adult teeth to um, form and erupt. That is the wisdom teeth, so the molar teeth at the back of your jaw. So they appear from about the age of 15 at the earliest, um, and they can be quite variable in the timing when they erupt. So we can see those in the jaw here. So this individual must be um, older than 15 years of age. We can then look at areas across the skeleton. Now, something that jumps out to me straight away is when I'm looking at the long bones, so this is the humerus bone, so the upper arm, I can see a really clear, distinct line at the top of this bone. So this tells me something about this individual's age because of the way bones develop. So when you're a child, you have three um, separate elements or at least three elements um, to a long bone. You have the main shaft and then you have the two ends of the long bone. These are called epiphyses and these are separate and that allows the bone to grow. 
So as you grow, as you get taller and taller, um, your bones grow. And then once you kind of reach your full growth potential, these will fuse together. And then that, that's the end of your kind of growing um, in height. So because I can see this really clear line, that tells me that although this bone is fused, it's happened really recently. So that indicates this is quite a young individual. So we can see that clearly on that upper arm bone, the humerus. Uh, we can see it quite nice and clearly on this thigh bone as well, this line running across here. So now I'm just looking to see if there are any of those areas which haven't fully fused. Um, I can see one of them here. So this is on one of the lower arm bones, the ulna. I actually have a separate end to that bone. So that one hasn't fused yet. Other areas I can see where the bones haven't fused. If I look at the pelvis, so this is part of the hip bone, there's quite an irregular surface to the top of this area. Now, this area is called the iliac crest, and this is also has a separate area that fuses as you become adult. So this bit is unfused in this individual. Another area that I can see that we have that is unfused is the clavicle. So this is the collarbone that is also unfused at this end. And in fact, this is the last bone in the body to fuse. So that tends to fuse kind of into your 20s um, towards your late 20s. It should be fully fused. So when I look at the skeletal evidence along with the dental evidence, so the dentition is telling me this individual should be over the age of 15. But some of these areas where we're not seeing fusion of elements yet, that's telling me this individual is probably under the age of about 19. So therefore, we have someone who's a late teen, an adolescent, probably aging to between 15 to 19 years of age. So then I might want to try and work out, can I, can I tell the individual's um, sex from their remains? Are they male or female? So the most important bone to look at in that respect is going to be the pelvis. And that's because females have to have a wider pelvic inlet to allow for the birth of quite large brained, uh, large headed infants. So they need wide angles on the pelvis to allow for a wider pelvic inlet. So one of the angles that we look at is called the sciatic notch. So here's one side, this is the right side uh, of our pelvis, and we look at this angle here. So this is the sciatic notch. So in females, that angle would probably be roughly um, that large if I kind of look between my thumb and my fingers, at quite a nice wide angle. If we look at this individual, that angle is not um, anywhere near that wide, it's much narrower. So this indicates to me that this is a male individual. There are other features we can look at on the front of the pelvis. They're a bit damaged um, in this individual, uh, but again, from the shape and the morphology of this part of the bone, again, this is indicating it's a male individual to me. Again, the angle down here looks quite uh, narrow as well. So we have a male, uh, they're kind of late teenager. So they're quite young. So, you know, we might think, well, why, why have they died so young? Well, within the context that we know about the site they came from, we know that it was a leprosy hospital. So that would lead us to look particularly across the skeleton for any signs of disease. But of course, we're particularly going to be looking for any signs that this individual actually had leprosy. So leprosy tends to affect the facial area and the hands and the feet, and it tends to cause bone destruction. So we're looking for areas where the bone is destroyed, eroded. 
Also, any type of infectious disease can also cause new bone to form as well. So we're kind of looking for both bone destruction, but we're also looking for evidence across the skeleton for maybe bone formation that might be associated with infection. So if we start off looking at the skull, in particular that area around the upper jaw called the maxilla, we do see some evidence for bone destruction. If we look inside the area of the palate, so the roof of the mouth, it's quite porous. So we certainly see some uh, porosity there. And if we look on the front of this area, we also see some erosion around this area, some bone resorption, um, and also a little bit of new bone formation as well. So whilst that could be indicative of um, periodontal disease or gum disease, um, in this context, it could also be um, indicative of early stages of leprosy. Then we would also look at the bones of the hands and the feet. So the hand bones are kind of nicely laid out here. And they all look quite complete. But if we look at the bones of the feet, which are just down here, um, and I think you can see the one here, apologies, the gas taps in the lab are slightly in the way. We can see that the little end bones, the little phalanges, they do have some erosion and particularly some porosity. So on this little um, bone that's part of the big toe, we can see it's quite porous on the end um, and some erosion to that bone as well. So there are some subtle indications that this individual suffered from leprosy. We also have a very subtle um, piece of evidence for general kind of infection. If we look on this um, tibia bone, so this is the shin bone, there's a little area here that is slightly discoloured. So hopefully you can just see like a little discoloured patch of area. And what that is, that's where some extra new bone growth um, has been placed on the cortical surface, the outer surface of this tibia bone. And that's something that is generally associated with infectious disease. It doesn't tend to be specific to a particular infection, but as we've got evidence for leprosy in other parts of the skeleton, it's likely that um, that particular bacterial infection, Mycobacterium leprae, is the cause of that. So we have some evidence for a particular disease that this individual had. Um, there's also some evidence potentially that they had a slightly difficult start to life. So we have some evidence on the teeth, on the enamel, they have slight little lines across them. And this is associated with a period of stress to the growing child. And what happens, they are stressed and that might be due to malnutrition. It might be due to the infectious disease and that they were quite unwell. And what happens, the body, the enamel of the teeth ceases to grow for a short period. And then when it restarts again, it leaves these telltale lines within the teeth. If you had access to x-ray equipment, uh, you can take x-rays of the bones and they do a similar thing. They leave these telltale lines in the bone where the bone stops growing for a short time and then when it resumes it leaves a little line running across it. But those you can't see from macroscopic um, analysis, so just by looking at them in the lab, you can only see those looking at a radiograph. So we have our young male, they suffer from stress during their childhood, they have signs of leprosy on their body. They were buried in the cemetery associated with a leprosy hospital. So hopefully you've enjoyed just that little introduction 
um, to a bit of evidence from one of the skeletons in our collection. Um, and hopefully you've enjoyed just having a look at one of our lab spaces as well. Um, and maybe that will kind of tempt you to come down um, to one of our open days um, and you'll come and get to see the labs and around the campus um, for yourself at some point. And I look forward to meeting you um, if you come along.